next talk is uh, by dr shikan mukhwas sir is regarding gas bloating belching and aerophagia so i request dr mukhwas sir uh, to present the talk i think this is our move thanks uh, chairpersons um, this is a very interesting topic though we've been practicing for the last 40 years i think uh, much um, weightage has not been given to this topic and i thought that i'll discuss this now um, the concept is gas is so important especially in indian subcontinent everybody is focused and you know obsessed i should say obsessed with the gas but looking at the quantity it is only 100 to 200 ml of volume which is there i was just surprised to read that stomach has only 10 ml of gas and the small intestine has 10 ml of gas it's predominantly the gas is there in the large intestine and that is around 100 ml the composition it's mainly nitrogen predominantly nitrogen you have oxygen co2 hydrogen and methane their composition varies depending upon the bacterial flora and what you eat and what is the substrate the distribution of the gas occurs the amongst the gi tract which i have discussed input of the gas predominantly input occurs once you eat something the gas goes in that's a major input apart from that the carbonated beverages that causes input i think that we will see in the next and the gas is liberated by organisms and metabolism so these are four sources of the gas and the output the eructations they bring out the gas the flatters organisms consume gas so there is a dynamic process which is under the tight control which with the intake and output being controlled it's very interesting to know that there are ct volumetric techniques which can measure the amount of the gas and the second technique is a washout technique by which you can flush the gas collect via rectum push it through the balloon filled uh, tube in the jejunum and pushing the argon gas you can measure radio labeled argon is used and you can measure and wash out and the accuracy has been quite good in both these techniques there occurs a diffusion of gas between the lumen and the blood as you can see here the the this is a stomach and the predominant the gas is present in the large intestine in the standing position sorry in the standing position this is there in the supine position while in the standing position the entire gas sorry in i think this is in supine position the gas is above because it is lighter so you see the gas above and the fasting and the post meal post meal the gas increases but if you see stomach small intestine and colon the the gas in the colon increases but not so much in stomach and the small intestine now what is bloating bloating is subjective while distension is objective so bloating is gassiness fullness trapped gas or feeling of pressure ladies feel that i feel that i am like a pregnant woman so objective is many people they say that post prandially my abdominal girth increases so that is objective 
60% of the bloating patients will complain of uh, distension. So basically, both these terms can be go hand in hand. What is the prevalence in general population? 16 to 31%, almost 3 out of 1 person, a normal person would complain of bloating. 2 out of 3 persons in IBS would say that gas is there. It impairs quality of life in 50%, which is a significant number and coincides with other GI disorders. Now, in all functional bowel disease, what you have is a Rome 4 criteria. So, functional bloating and distinction should be the only predominant symptom without the other things like IBS, constipation, diarrhea, and postprandial distress syndrome. So you rule uh, should not have all these things. It should be the only symptom, at least one day a week, predominant symptom, onset six months, and should be active for last three months. So that is defined. And in clinical practice, what you have is a mixed bag people will have bowel symptoms and nobody will come predominantly with only bloating and distension. But I recently got a young girl who's come from the States who was only having predominant bloating and sensation without any altered bowels. And I was happy to see that she was better with rifaximin. What is a pathophysiology? A very complex pathophysiology when you don't understand, it's always said to be multifactorial, always can be organic and functional. So though the percentage of organic diseases are less, functional is more. It is already presumed that the gas is more in these patients, but it has been seen by volumetry that only 25% have more gas. So Dietary factors, the pathophysiology are dietary factors, small intestinal factors, large intestinal factors, abnormal motility and brain gut axis. So I'll be discussing pathophysiology along this. It's a common misnomer that the gas is increased, but it's only increased in one fourth of the patients. A SIBO. Once you have the, um, the two important factors which are there in bloating and distension is SIBO and carbohydrate intolerance. One has to give importance to this. And it is said that bacterial fermentation of carbohydrate leads to more gas. The prevalence in the food intolerance has been seen into the large extent in many uh, with lactose, fructose, especially dis disaccharides or unabsorbed sugars. There was one study which has shown that patients with IBS, those who did not have bloating, had a less number of ruminococcus and eubacteria. So probably these are the two organisms which are responsible for bloating of the patient or the abnormal motility is there, gastroparesis, scleroderma, intestinal pseudo obstruction. It's been seen that patients who are IBS constipation with slow transit will have more gas as compared to those with normal transit. Probably gives more time for bacterial fermentation. Pelvic floor dysfunction delays the transit and is responsible for gas. This is uh, the abdominophrenic dyssynergia. That is also supposed to be one of the factors for perceiving distension or the bloating of the abdomen. What happens? Normal 
normally when the gas goes into the intestine the reaction in a normal person is that the diaphragm goes up and the abdominal muscle contracts so that that is how the longitudinal capacity of the stomach increases by movement of the diaphragm up and the contraction of the muscles in patients who have abnormal viscerosomatic reflux the diaphragm contracts and comes down and the abdominal wall relaxes so a reverse happen and this is abdominal phrenic dyssynergia which is also one of the important factors for perceiving distension visceral hypersensitivity there are experiments where the balloon distension have shown increased sensitivity and there is a complex gut brain interaction initially it was seen as brain gut interaction but now the term is changed to gut brain because gut has importance over brain and the it is increased by anxiety depression somatization uh apart from organic causes as i said two important things which you should remember you have a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and carbohydrate intolerance are the important factors but apart from that celiac disease pancreatic disease malignancies obstructions hypothyroidism all are associated but in clinical practice what you have more important is functional dyspepsia and functional bloating which accounts for the majority of them history now once you have this you have to find out whether this is a food related what are the bowel habits history of surgery medicines most important alarm symptoms physical examination and rectal examination breath test i think we have been using breath test much less i think these are the group of patients where the breath test should be used mainly to confirm about carbohydrate malabsorption you may have to do celiac serology endoscopy if they have alarm symptoms and anorectal functions if they have altered bowels so the diet is they should be asked to take low food map diet in gastroenterology irritable bowel low food map functional dyspepsia low food map bloating low food map so all you know low food map and gluten free diet are the important and the improvement occurs in 80% so the first step is change their diet second you may use probiotic and antibiotic the these are the groups bifidobacter l sporogens bacillus have been found to be useful there are trials of rifaximin given cyclically for a period of years with global symptom improvement 41% versus 22% with placebo reduction of bloating scores and hydrogen breath test so what you should not eat the important things which you should not eat are all good things you know mango the mango the watermelon i always try to remember it like that the mango watermelon apple pear so these are the fruits which you should not eat you should not be eating milk ice cream honey sugar all these are very tempting things and then you should not be eating the cabbage full gobi broccoli onion and lasun and kaju and kismis so <laughs> this is all the high food map diet you should not be eating and what you should eat is all this rest you can always eat treatment antispasmodics have been treated with global improvement 46% 38% lubiprestol linactotide procalopride and tegaserod are mainly for patients who have constipation neuromodulators amitriptyline escitalopram where you feel that there is a phrenic visceral sensory dyssynergia or increased visceral sensitivity 
there is an improvement with peppermint oil and some japanese medication and hypnotherapy kya ho gaya ha so i will come to the approach of these patients when you have patients with chronic bloating and distension first thing which you should find whether there are alarm symptoms what are alarm symptoms whether the patient has anemia weight loss gi bleed if yes pay, get the endoscopy labs and imaging and find out the organic disease if no are there symptoms predominant to altered bowels yes then if constipation get their manometry and transit study if diarrhea check celiac serology or sibo bread test if no are the symptoms diet related if the symptoms are diet related institute low fodmap diet improvement continue no then treat for some abnormal viscerosomatic reflux improvement yes continue therapy if no consider breath test so basically in a patient with bloating find out alarm symptoms if alarm symptoms investigate find out bowel related if bowel related get manometry find out food related try them low food map diet and if that does not get better then you can have antibiotics and visero uh, uh, visceral analgesics to use now another symptom which is common in practice is belching what is belching it's a oral expulsion of the air from the upper gi tract it can be audible or silent what is a physiological 30 times in a day is a gastric belching and the 13 times per day is supra gastric belching epidemiology 3.4% referral 50% of the dyspeptic symptoms will have belching the diagnostic criteria according to rome 4 it should be bothersome more than 3 times a week onset 6 months before active 3 months for a period of 3 months now belching you have predominantly two types of belching gastric and supra gastric belching in the gastric belching the escape of the air occurs from the stomach to esophagus during the transient relaxation of the ileus and in supra gastric belching it's a behavior disorder what you get is the contraction of diaphragm that causes a negative pressure wherein the air is sucked from the atmosphere into the esophagus sometimes it doesn't go into the stomach and is expelled out this and in another there is a contraction of tongue and pharynx the pharynx pressure increases over esophagus which leads to ingestion of the air in the esophagus i'll give you these simple diagrams what happens in supra gastric belching because of diaphragmatic contraction there occurs a negative pressure in the esophagus which leads to transfer of air from the atmosphere to esophagus as you can see here and the ileus is closed and that causes a reversal of the air at in the opposite direction so this a uh, hardly any quantity of air goes into the stomach in the supra gastric belching the comes in the esophagus and goes out while in gastric belching what you have is a intragastric stomach when there is a transient relaxation the stomach the air goes out the ileus is closed and pressure increases and the air distends the esophagus which leads to relaxation of the upper esophageal pressure so supra gastric is voluntary while gastric is involuntary reflux mediated this is not physiological this is physiological requires medical attention does not rarely requires attention 
does not occur during sleep if you talk to the patient you have patients coming in opd continuous belching immediately diagnose that this is a supragastric belching anxiety disorder if you talk to the patient his belching will stop does not occur during sleep it's a high frequency within a minute patient will belch on 10 15 times this is less frequency why what is difference between supragastric belching and aerophagia there is a air suction air stays in stomach for a while but goes out main symptom is belching wherein air is swallowed transported distally by peristalsis into the intestine colon leading to bloating distension and flatulence so aerophagia the main symptom is bloating distension and flatulence associations 50% of the patients will have belches 50% and they have supragastric belches the reason is not known but they respond to ppi for patients with functional disorders dyspepsia rumination ocd bulimia anxiety have also belches excessive repetitive belching is supragastric impedance is gold standard and now you see here the graph of impedance moves from here to this direction so this is gastric while in supragastric it is moving like this so it is a supragastric belching so sometimes to differentiate between the two one has to use impedance and this is a manometry i will not go into the details the aerophagia the moment of the gas now what is the treatment if it is a supragastric belching the treatment is behavior disorders required psychoeducation the patient try to rule out organic disease because the patient wants that their organic disease to be ruled out speech therapy has been associated with significant relief you have to sit with the patient tell him what is the mechanism so there are basically it's a sort of reassurance psychotherapy explaining the patient mechanism but the speech therapy and cognitive therapy are the ones which are important there are there is any hardly any role of um, drug therapy in these disorders thank you thank you sir for covering this important topic in our clinical practice uh, very nice lecture uh, any questions sir in supragastric belching why there is a, a, a pressure point which initiate belch हस्बैंड दबाता है एक हाथ दबाया तो डकार निकल रही है दिस इज कॉमन सिम्टम बट इट इज सीन यूनिवर्सली एवरीबडी इज सेइंग सेम सेम थिंग वेल दिस पेशेंट्स नेवर कम टू कम इन कांटेक्ट विद इच अदर सो इज देयर एनी मैकेनिज्म पॉसिबली हाई स्पेशल बाय हस्बैंड ही हाइपर सेंसिटिविटी रिलेटेड सो बेसिकली यू नो व्हेन इट स्टार्ट्स सुप्रागैस्ट्रिक बेल्चिंग स्टार्ट एज अ फिनोमेना when you have contractions of diaphragm negative pressure the air being sucked in and then you know that becomes a habit in the due course of time and the patient tries to do it probably to attract the attention that is what is said about supragastric belching what i have found what i have found in these patients uh, they have continuous habits and they come in obedient sit up sit like this so when putting her, after putting her eyes to the respond <laughs> so so and uh, that vanishes most of the time how long i basically don't so know uh, so about the right to treatment but i think oh, if you drive the attention divert their attention or if the patient during sleep or talking to the patient all these supragastric uh, belches they disappear because probably that rise to be causing irritation and that is diverting their mind yeah so maybe it's a counter irritation counter irritation yeah. something maybe it's working but in the literature i couldn't find anything of this sort evidence based yes uday sir common symptom of gas is the complaint of gas rising into the head in the gas 
sir it is migraine migraine it is mostly no i don't think that there is a physiological base for it <laughs> yeah amit sir very nice, very nice talk and a very important topic <laughs> ऑन कर for ji already diaphragmatic breathing has shown to be an effective therapy yeah yeah around therapy so probably all of these can be addressed by going for diaphragmatic breathing That's yeah in fact um, uh, i i had that slide of diaphragmatic uh, breathing but i could not uh, get the solid references uh, showing the importance of diaphragmatic breathing maybe they theoretical but are there any control trials for gerd yeah so is that anulom vilom yes sir have you seen increase in the incidence of reflux following uh, uh, patanjali yoga kapal bhati se pet khinchte repeated breathing see basically has it increased actually lot many patients have come yeah. who who were doing this and then they started getting reflux symptoms See, basically, if you do reflux, is such a common thing, you know. So unless until you do a quite a scientific study to find out whether, and there are different type of yogas people do. So anything I think which increases the intra-abdominal pressure, uh, probably uh, the patient should be more prone for GERD-like symptoms, you know. Anything you take in the air and take out. Uh, excel out so if such things are there anything can that uh, is going to bond increase the intra abdominal pressure leading to more reflux but, but probably eventually your diaphragm may become strong and the uh, les may become <laughs> tighter <laughs> we came across See, one patient of uh, sma obstruction <laughs> i know <laughs> i i know yeah. i know the patient <laughs> and who was doing kapalbhati for 600 times also 